I really love introducing the next speaker because it's very rare that you actually meet someone who's changed history, who's changed the course of human history, changed our understanding of human history. And the work that Robert Schock did originally with John West on the dating of the Sphinx and the erosion there going back at least 10,000 years was, was a shock to the no pun intended, a shock to the intellectual, uh, straight-laced Egyptian-minded community, the historians, and um, they haven't really been able to deal with the truth that this person uncovered. So to hear his latest research and see where we're going from that initial discovery that um, John West brought Robert Schock in to make and to calculate on the geology of what happened there at the Sphinx and now how he's developed uh, a whole theory of the ancient past and the weather erosion and the weather around the planet and the, the ice ages. It's really an important part of our human history and the development of human civilization and also what's more important how this is going to affect us in the future. So Robert takes us from the past, the ancient past, into the future and see where do we stand as a civilization. So when he's ready there, let's give Robert Schock a very big hand for coming all the way from Boston to be here with us today. Thank you, Robert. Okay, I appreciate you being here. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank, thank you. Is this, is this working? Okay, so I think that's what we're going to use. And thank you very much. I appreciate being here. I don't know what time it is, so I think I'm speaking until 7.30 because we're running about half an hour late. And I don't know if there's more people that still want to come in. I feel like I teach at Boston University, so... Like all the students come in. <laughs> okay, and actually I'm realizing that uh, before I actually start, maybe I'd be better off with that hand mic. I mean, this is, yeah, do you, I, I'm sorry to do that to you. Yeah, I think, will that work better? I think that'll work better. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me with this? Okay, I think this is much better and this does give me a little more freedom to move around. Okay, so I want to talk, this is my first time at Portal to Ascension. I, some people know me and know me well who are here, but I've also spoken to a number of people who've heard of me or have seen me, but really haven't seen me speak, uh, don't know that much about my work, should we say, or only little bits and pieces. So what I plan to do is really give an overview of my research, which goes back about three decades at this point, and some of the highlights. And I will start with uh, really my work that you already heard mentioned, which was with the late John Anthony West. He and I were very close colleagues. I'll actually come full circle and end with John Anthony West also. So uh, that's where we're going. So I call this cycles of time, the rise and fall of civilization. I see that, that I am not doing that. Do you see it waving? I don't know if it's nervous. Uh, but the Egyptians, the Egyptians, the ancient dynastic Egyptians talked about something that they called Zeptepi. And Zeptepi was, in, for them, in a crude sense, it was the first time. It was the beginning. It was sort of the origins of civilization. They saw it as we can interpret it, basically as a golden age. They talked about the gods, whatever the gods were, living among humans. And they put this back at a very, very remote period. So we're talking now dynastic Egyptians referring to something that goes much further back. When I say dynastic Egyptians, we're talking, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, and they were talking about something very ancient relative to themselves. We also have the classical ancients, and when I say the classical ancients, I'm talking about the, 
you know, the Greeks, um, Plato, uh, and they talked about things like a world age, world ages, golden ages, a cyclical view of history, and one version of this, or one uh, thing that Plato talked about, everyone knows, is Atlantis. And Atlantis being a high civilization that again preceded them, went back much, much further. The uh, other traditions that we have around the world, and there are many traditions, I'm not going to mention all of them, but one that many people are familiar with is the Hindu concept of the cycles of the ages, the Yuga cycles, the Mayans talked about uh, the similar types of things. So we have this concept, but of course, and I say of course because I'm in, I am in academia, I teach full-time at Boston University, I have since the 1980s, most of my academic colleagues dismiss any notion of civilization more than about 5,000 plus years ago, say five to 6,000 years ago at the outside boundary as total nonsense. It's just myth, it's just tradition. They were uh, making themselves feel good or upping their credentials, if you would, to say they had, they had a very long history, these ancient people, what we consider ancient at 5,000 years ago. This started to change, I believe, when I say I believe, based on the evidence, my own thinking, with my work with John Anthony West. And here he and I are on, unfortunately, what would be our last trip to Egypt back in 2016. He passed away earlier this year. Uh, but we put together work. He got me involved in the work on the Great Sphinx and redating the Great Sphinx. And now this ties in with other sites, other evidence for civilization, advanced civilization, and a much earlier period. When I first got involved in this, the classic notion, which is really still the classic academic notion in the status quo circles, is that civilization first arises in Mesopotamia slightly later in Egypt, uh, in particular those two regions, maybe a little bit later in the Far East, about 3500 BC. So around that period, 2500 BC is the classical date for the origins of the Sphinx, de novo, more or less that it was carved from scratch, from the bedrock at 2500 BC. This began to fall apart for me, this paradigm, in 1990 when I first actually went to Egypt in real life, should we say, not just studying it from books, that type of thing, or photographs, but actually went there to investigate, and I've been there many, many times since, but I went there, there's John West and myself, this was taken in 2016, I went there at the invitation of John Anthony West specifically to investigate from a geological point of view, how old is the Sphinx? And ultimately it led to us um, developing not just the Sphinx work, but taking it much further than that. And we were first introduced by a colleague at Boston University because John Anthony West was looking for a, as he referred to an open-minded geologist who would actually look at this issue. Um, it turns out, I, I was amazed that no one had really looked into it before. It was one of these things, and this is important, I believe, that different disciplines in academia tend not to talk to each other too much. So the Egyptologists, they study things like the Sphinx. The geologists might study Eocene rocks, which is what the Sphinx is carved out of, limestones, but they don't actually apply their expertise to the Sphinx. Just to orient you a little bit, do you see the Sphinx? Circled there. This is the Great Pyramid, Second Pyramid, Third Pyramid here. It sits due east. This is a picture from 1930-ish. This is a picture I took a number of years ago. This shows that the Sphinx, only the head actually stood above the level of the plateau initially. Uh, the body, to carve the body, they actually cut down into the bedrock. Also notice, does the Sphinx's head look a little small for you? It's not the original head. It is a recarved head. I'm absolutely certain of that. It's a car carved, recarved head, and when you recarve something, it's going to get smaller. 
This is young me. I don't know if you can recognize me. <laughs> young me with my field book and jacket, but I'm in the Sphinx enclosure looking at the erosional patterns. Bottom line is that I have no doubt, I had no doubt at the time, and I have no doubt to this day, in fact, it's only re been reconfirmed for me as I've studied it more and more, that this is evidence of precipitation, rainfall, running over the rocks, beating down on the rocks, causing these types of rounded, what I call rounded rolling features. You can see this in the diagram here. And very importantly, cutting these fissures. Now, yes, these fissures are along weak zones in the rock, but they are cut by rainfall runoff. The problem for the Egyptologists is that this area, here you can see the Sphinx in its enclosure, this area has been hyper-arid. It's been Sahara Desert for the last 5,000 years. If the Sphinx was only carved 4,500 years ago, how can this be the case? So immediately, and when I say immediately, I mean when I first went to Egypt in 1990, my first trip there, I said there was something amiss with the geology and the chronology. There had to be an explanation for this. So just looking at it a little bit more, I do want to point out that's young me and John Anthony West. Uh, this is due to rainfall runoff. There's a lot of diagnostic features of rainfall runoff, often including scalloping and whatnot along the edge here, the vertical fissures. Sometimes people think it's due to Nile flooding. No, it's not. Nile floods, yes, did sometimes come up to the paws of the Sphinx and around the base. I'm aware of that. Very rarely, but there's records of that occurring. When I say rarely, I'm speaking as a geologist. That's occurred in modern times too, but then you've got problems with the Aswan Dam and the rising water tables, etc. If this were Nile flooding, or as some people have suggested, if they actually filled this in with water to make a moat around the Sphinx, it would not give this form of weathering and erosional features. I don't want to beat that into the ground now, but I just want people to be aware. I've certainly looked at such things. We did seismic work around the Sphinx. More or less, we used a sledgehammer on a steel plate. This is um, Boris Said. This is Thomas DeBecky, a geophysicist who uh, was working with us at the time. This is early 1990s, John Anthony West, the subject of uh, study, the Sphinx, my young me. And what we found is that we had uneven weathering around the Sphinx. What this suggests, doesn't just suggest, I mean, it's very evident to me, the Sphinx was actually carved out initially on three sides. Then it was later fully carved in the back. This level of weathering, which is much more shallow in the back, is compatible with and compares well with the subsurface mineralogical changes, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about subsurface weathering, that we have for other Old Kingdom, dynastic, fourth dynasty tombs and structures that are supposedly contemporaneous with the original Sphinx. Does everyone follow? The fact that you have much, much deeper weathering around the other three sites indicates that this was carved out earlier. The body was carved out earlier. And actually what happens when you look there is that initially, do you see how you have the older weathering here? The Sphinx was only carved down to this point approximately initially, so it emerged out of the bedrock, and then I believe in the fourth dynasty, about 2500 BC, they were not carving the Sphinx originally, they were recarving parts of it, including the head, sometime in dynastic times, along the back, etc. So initially, the Sphinx actually emerged from the bedrock, which is interesting because in the age of Leo, about 10,000 BC, when the Sphinx, the Sphinx sits due east, at that time in the age of Leo, what rose on the horizon due east on the vernal equinox, the constellation Leo. And when you view it from this vantage point, arguably it 
rises that way with the rump. You see how the rump sort of attaches to the rising initially as it comes up. Now, I am not basing my dating on Leo and when Leo rose. But I think it's interesting that it's compatible and seems to tie in with my dating. My dating currently for the core portion of the Sphinx, the core body of the Sphinx is about 10,000 BC. Why? What I've done is calibrate how quickly or slowly, I should say, the subsurface weathering will take place. So it's really based, my, the core dating for me is based primarily on the seismic evidence and calibrating that. And you can read about that if you want to in Origins of the Sphinx. I'll show a picture of that book in shortly. And I'm not pushy, I'm just saying that's where you get more information on this. But it ties in and seems to be corroborated by a number of other lines of evidence, including that we might be talking about the age of Leo. So we did other work. This is uh, another seismic map. This is showing structures under the Sphinx. This is, we were not looking for structures under the Sphinx. I was actually looking for subsurface mineralogical changes, weathering. But we found some structures. We found a chamber or cavity under the rump here. It turns out the ancient, the ancient Egyptians, the modern Egyptologists knew about that. Um, we didn't know about when we found it, but they said they knew about it. So that confirmed that the seismic work was good. We also found sort of a linear feature here, which is probably, I think, a collapsed tunnel type feature. But most importantly, we found a chamber under the left pod. You see the, this is the map of the Sphinx. So you're looking down on it. And this is her left paw. Everyone see? And so we found this chamber underneath this. And this was really interesting because could this, even back then we speculate, could this be an archive from Zeptepi? Could it be an archive from quote, Atlantis, I hate to use that term, or could it be archived at least from that earlier civilization, that earlier advanced period? Um, that was bad enough to be finding something like that and maybe speculating about it. Back in those days, I would not say the A word publicly, and the A word was, for me, it was Atlantis. Forget about alien, <laughs> but, but Atlantis. Um, I still don't say the second one, <laughs> right? No, no, because I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very, I don't know, academic, yeah. Well, that's an A word too, isn't it? <laughs> now that I think of it. <laughs> anyway, getting back, getting back, just having fun with it now. Um, getting, getting back to it, it did not help me that this man, who is this? Edgar Cayce, it turns out, had predicted a hall of records of Atlantis, a chamber under or near the paws of the Sphinx. I knew who Edgar Cayce was. Um, I admit that. I wasn't that naive, but I did not know he had predicted halls of records or anything to do about the Sphinx. I would not read any of the Cayce writings or readings at that point. And I just make that clear because some people have accused me in and out of academia that, oh, I was going there to chase after Casey and prove him right. No, I didn't care less. In fact, it was sort of embarrassing when this came up. But we'll move on. Something that we wondered was, what was the Sphinx originally? The head, when you look at the head, it is much less weathered. Did you notice that? than the rest of the body. It's not the original head. There was no doubt in my mind the ancient Egyptians circa 2500 BC were repairing the Sphinx. They put all little blocks along the Sphinx, around the Sphinx, on the paws. When you go to see the Sphinx today, can you see the paws? I would contend no, because they've been covered over with repair blocks. So you're not seeing the original paws. Some of those repair blocks are pretty old, but they're not the original paws. What did they do with the head, though? They recarved it. Was it originally a human or humanoid head? I don't know. The thing that I favored and John Anthony West favored was that it was originally a lion. 
And we were always thinking a male lion. Why Leo in the sky, constellations, age of Leo, etc. But then, it, this came out very recently last year, and uh, the lead author here is Dr. Manu Saifzadeh, who happens to be here, so I can point him out, embarrass him. And he came up with something very, very brilliant, which is that something that her perplexed Egyptologists, and I had heard plenty about, is that the Sphinx is so much older, why are there no textual references to it? I mean, this, the Egyptians, dynastic Egyptians, they've been using hieroglyphs, etc. Why didn't they ever mention the Sphinx if it's so much older? In fact, this is a problem because they weren't mentioning it a lot in the Old Kingdom either. It turns out it wasn't a sphinx at the time, and it wasn't a male lion at the time, it was a female lion. It was a lioness. The uh, paper that um, uh, we put together, Dr. Saifzadeh, Manu, was very uh, generous and brought myself and Robert Bouval on. Everyone, have people heard of Robert Bouval? Yeah, good friend of mine, and uh, I'll come back to him in a minute. But we put together, ultimately, a paper, and you can read this. There's a popular article about it on my website, robertshock.com. There's a link to the original paper, but it's called A New Interpretation of a Rare Old Kingdom Dual Title, The King's Chief Librarian and the Guardian of the Royal Archives of Methit. I think Edgar Cayce would like it, actually. Uh, and this is Hemi... I can never say it. Hemi Unu of the fourth dynasty. He was um, an overseer. He was involved with the Khufu pyramid, the Great Pyramid, attributed to Khufu. And uh, what Dr. Saifzadeh pointed out, can you see his toes there? Cute little toes. But underneath this, there is an inscription. This is a statue of him. There are seven symbols. And can you see them? Say no. No, not really. That's why I have the next slide. There's his toes. That's why I was pointing out the toes. And you can see there's his symbols. There's an axe, an inkwell and reed, a sedge, a bread loaf, another axe, an unknown rod, a bent rod, and then a lioness. And this is a rendition that Katie, my wife, Catherine Ulysses, did it of it. Here we have it, and basically, to make a long story short, this is the lioness, this is in other inscriptions, this is the name of the goddess Methit, who was a, in some forms a guardian goddess. So what's going on here? What is this bent rod? And this is where the brilliance of Manu came in, if I could say it that way, and you'll tell me if I misrepresent anything, he determined, he discovered that this is a key. And I'm not talking a metaphorical key or a literary key, it's a literal key, you know, physical key that could go into a lock. So what does this represent? That she, Methit, is, rep, is guarding an archive, and there's a key, there's a lock to it. Doesn't that make sense? Once you start to see it, and he, as part of his Hemiunu's title, he was the overseer. He was maybe the physical holder of the key, if you would, or at least held that position. Here are other things that uh, uh, Dr. Saifzadeh found in particular. This goes back to the 31st century. So this is well before when the Sphinx was supposedly carved, according to Egyptologists. Do you see it again? And here's a different form of the key, but you see a rising out of the body. And then look at this. Does it look like it's over a building or facade? And this is this Tutmosis IV stella between the paws of the Sphinx, erected about 1400 BC. But there you see the Sphinx, and this has eluded many people, or been very mysterious. Why is the Sphinx sitting over what looks like a structure? And what I think now is that we can interpret this, well, we can interpret this overseer of the scribes of the king and master of the key to the lioness, or 
more, we'll say, fluidly, the king's chief librarian and guardian of the royal archives of Methit. The Great Sphinx was originally the lion's, lioness Methit guarding a chamber literally underneath her. And we had already found that back in the early 1990s. And so I'm convinced that there's an archive there, there's a genuine archive, it may contain records, could go back to this earlier period, we just don't know. Is there, is, would it be important to go in there? I think so. Also because of rising water tables, et cetera, it may be flooded now, so it's even more important. Other things, I just started to mention this before, but the repair blocks, these are ancient repair blocks, these are more modern repair blocks. Everyone here, do people know Zai Hawass? Yeah, some of you have heard of him? Yeah, Zai Hawass doesn't agree with me on any of this, just be fair to him, but he did tell me that these are Old Kingdom blocks. Now, why would they repair it in Old Kingdom times if it had been carved in Old Kingdom times? Why would we have a meter or more erosion on it within maybe 100 or 200 or 300 years, even if these are later Old Kingdom? And I think it's, I've always thought that from a geological point of view, it's quite evident that the core body of the Sphinx goes back to a much earlier period. Initially, I was talking about five to 7,000 BC because I was trying to push, this was in my younger years, back in the 90s, I was trying to push unconsciously, I realized in hindsight, make it as young as possible so I wouldn't offend anyone too much. It turns out from my the point of, from the point of view of the Egyptologists and historians in academia, whether I said 5,000 BC or 10,000 BC, they wouldn't make any difference to them anyway. I mean, I was only a heretic, yes, that is exactly it. Uh, right now, as I said, I actually put it back to about 10,000 BC based on analysis of the seismic work. It's interesting that the one criticism I got back in the early 90s when I first presented this, the one criticism I got from my geological colleagues was the very thing that I acknowledge now. They told me, a number of them told me, looking at my raw data, that if anything, I was underestimating the age based on the geological evidence, not overestimating it. And I acknowledge if I went wrong, that's where I went wrong. Other evidence, uh, we have right elsewhere in Egypt, I just want to mention two that might, um, that are intriguing. We have the Red Pyramid at Dashur. This was first pointed out by Doug Kenyon to give credit where credit's due, where it looks like this pyramid, which is older by standard dating than the Great Pyramid, is actually built over a much older structure. Also down in Abydos, we have the Syrian, which is below the New Kingdom level, ground level and looks very similar to the Valley Temple, which I didn't go into it now because of time constraints, actually is contemporaneous with the core body of the Sphinx because the major limestone blocks that were used to build this temple were carved out simultaneously with the carving of the body of the Sphinx. We know that geologically. I show this picture, it's an old picture from the late 19th century just because it shows a view that you can't see to this day because they've excavated more out. Um, looking at the Red Pyramid, can everyone see how you have a much older weathered structure and then the newer pyramid built on top of it? So I think that what they were doing here was preserving a much earlier structure and building around and over it. There you see another picture of that. Here in Abydos, you have the um, beautiful temple, Seti Temple, but you go out it and you go out the back door, so to speak, and you see this. It looks like it's carved into the dirt, like you know, somehow they decide to put a basement in. 
behind the temple. I don't think that's what the case was at all. Uh, this is uh, traditionally the Syrian or the tomb of Osiris, or at least a piece of Osiris who was chopped up and buried many places, or at least parts of them are found in many places. And I think what we have here is a much older structure that was on this, we'll call it sacred site. The New Kingdom Egyptians knew this was an important site. They put their temple there, and in constructing their temple, they actually ran into the foundations and the older ruins of a much earlier temple. Sometimes it floods, sometimes it doesn't. Also want to point out that the Cyrus Orion theme, because who was Osiris in the sky, according to the ancient Egyptians? It was the constellation we know as Orion, is a prominent theme that you see in much of the ancient world. Uh, there's the uh, temple. This is the valley temple again, so you can compare it. Do you see how similar they look? People see that? Yeah. Uh, so this is the valley temple contemporaneous with the oldest portions of the Sphinx. And there's the Assyrian in Abydos. This is actually myself. Sometimes it floods. And you can see it there just to give you a sense of it. And I just wanted to point this out. Does everyone see the famous flower of life? This is where it's found, at least um, the oldest version of it. I know almost like graffiti on the walls of the Assyrian. But so many people look at it and they love it. And it is quite beautiful, isn't it? But that's, that's the original. A lot of people don't realize where it originates from. Something else, the Orion theme. This is the work of my uh, colleague, Robert Bouval. He, of course, did the Orion correlation theory, which comes back to the same period that we're talking about now, about 10,000, he puts it about 10,500 BC, but this is before the end of the last ice age, which ended geologically in 9,700 BC. He and I last year did a book together called Origins of the Sphinx, and I highly recommend that to you if you want to know details about Sphinx and Sphinx dating and the bigger um, picture. But I came under a lot of criticism for pushing the day of the Sphinx back. I was told that this is impossible. My academic colleagues, they, they were very, very upset about it. I won't go into that now. But they were really unhappy. They, uh, even people in Boston University were calling for me to be fired, et cetera, et cetera. The only reason I wasn't fired is because I was tenured. I was not stupid. I made sure I got tenure before I got into this. Actually, John Anthony West was very, very um, frustrated with me because he and I knew each other before I was tenured. And I would not talk about this or get involved or anything until I was tenured in 1990. And a month after I was tenured, I guess, I was in Egypt with him. That's true, yeah. Uh, because I really did. I didn't really think it was going to happen, but I wasn't taking chances, but people really were calling for me to be fired. It's changing now, fortunately. Uh, but one thing that I was criticized for is why are there no other sites that are sophisticated and going back, go, that go back to this earlier period? That was early 1990s. I first announced the work in 1991. We had a big conference about it in 1992 at the American Association for the Advancement of Science where I supposedly debated the Egyptologists. It was just sort of a talking past each other. But yeah, it was very bizarre. They wanted to just tell me I was wrong. I was trying to present data. They didn't want to look at the data. I'm not making this up. At one point, I'm showing them some of the detailed analysis, and the guy on the other side, I won't mention his name, is actually looking at my charts upside down. And I said, maybe we could turn them around. I mean, he, didn't, he was so clueless as to the data and what he was looking at that he didn't realize it was upside down. Um, you know, but it was really two disciplines talking at different levels. So I'm not trying to make fun of them so much, but you know, it gets into academia where you have specialized niches, specialized departments, and they don't interact. And if they do interact, if you if I come from geology and say that Egyptologists might have to, you know, 
rethink something, their reaction, I've found personally, tends to be, you know, what do they say, kill the messenger or something? <laughs> yeah, but they want to, yeah, they want to, they want to get rid of me. They don't want to sit down and talk about it. But anyway, addressing this, unfortunately, he's now deceased too, but Klaus Schmidt, the hair professor, Dr. Klaus Schmidt of the German Archaeological Institute, in 1995, several years later, began excavating this site of Gebekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey. And what attracted me to it initially was his publication of dates in the 10,000 to 8,000 BC range, despite its incredible sophistication. So we had to go see that. I've been there a number of times now. Here's Gebekli Tepe. It's between the Tigris, let me get it right, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Some people say that's just out of curiosity, the biblical Eden. But this goes back a good 12,000 years also, maybe parts of it even older by the latest analysis. And it was confirming my initial concept that civilization goes back to that early period, at least very sophisticated culture that I had developed based on the Sphinx. Um, with John Anthony West. There I am at Gebekli Tepe. Can you see how sophisticated it is? There are circles or rings, if you would, sort of Stonehenge-like, but if you think of Stonehenge, they're just big, I'm a geologist, so I don't really think of them as big, crude, ugly blocks, because all rocks are beautiful, right? <laughs> but, but these are much more finely carved, much more sophisticated. They've got carvings on them. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Uh, people argue exactly what this is um, representing. You can, uh, I'm working on a book now where I talk about what I think it is, but I'm not going to get into that now because I'm actually, I don't like throwing out things prematurely. Uh, but the point is it's incredibly sophisticated. I've spoken to archeologists off the record and I've asked them, if you found something like this at this level of sophistication, out of context, and you just had to put a date on it, one said, oh, maybe 1,000 BC at most. Another one said maybe 600 BC at most, not 9, 10,000 BC. You get my point? Now, they won't say that publicly, but that shows you the level. Here we are discussing it with a uh, Professor Schmidt, this is of course myself, that's John Anthony West. He came with us on the first trip. And these are beautifully carved, ornate. Look at this pillar, it's anthropomorphic. Do you see the little skinny arms and hands? And look at the beautiful belt, you see that? And it's got a loincloth on it. It's set in very shallowly in the bedrock. Uh, Professor Schmidt actually thought they used some kind of concrete substance. We're talking approximately 10,000 BC. This is not supposed to happen at that time. They're supposed to be cavemen, you know, primitive hunter gatherers, hunter gatherers that did not, were not capable of doing things like this, either socially or technologically. It turns out that the Truth is very, very different than what people say in the textbooks. But they're anthropomorphic, 10 to 15 tons, which is 10 to 15 tons, that's pretty sizable, but four and a half meters high or so, not as big as some pillars, not as impressive as 30, 40, 50, 60 tons that we have for some of the blocks in Egypt. But I want to point out, you see how they're tall and thin? To carve that, to erect them without snapping and breaking them, et cetera, is a feat unto itself. Here you can see here, do you see the belt, some close-ups of the belt, et cetera? Look at that H symbol. See how it looks like an H? Keep that in mind. It actually might refer to plasma when I come back to that. Plasma electrically charged or discharged particles. Uh, here you can see one of the um, stone circles. There's more sophistication here. This is one of the uh, papers by jo Peters and Schmidt, and I show it to you for the map. Do you see the circles, how they've mapped out the circles? They've excavated four plus so far. 
based on geophysics, it's a massive site. There's over 20 of these stone circles, most of which have yet to be excavated. Here's an uh, aerial view. This is actually a photograph of a photograph in the Urfa Museum. And you can see them. If we start looking at them, plotting them, I've reoriented things here. Or well, actually, I've, I've used a slightly different map. But this is from uh, Schmidt. But I drew in these black lines. Okay, Each stone circle has pillars around the edge. And then it has a pair in the middle. This is one of, one of those pairs. Actually, it's uh, from this pair here. And you have these anthropomorphic pillars that are looking to the south and slightly east. Does everyone follow what I'm saying? They are, I believe, looking astronomically. What are they looking at? And why do they shift a little bit? It turns out this is the older, oldest one stratigraphically, younger, younger, younger still. And what they seem to be doing is looking out toward Orion and that region of the sky. Orion tours Pleiades on the vernal equinox. Does this sound familiar? Having things oriented on the vernal equinox. Uh, in this case, they're not looking due east over to Leo, but south and slightly east toward this portion of the sky. But what did Bouval find on the Giza Plateau? He found the Orion connection also at this same period. I was actually embarrassed when I first found this because I thought, I thought, oh, people are just going to say I'm looking for Orion. No, it just turns out that's what it was. And why is it changing? Do people understand precession, or at least you've heard it? It changes over time. So they were reorienting over time, which is incredibly sophisticated. They were making very close observations for a couple of thousand years at least. This is just showing Orion and uh, Taurus in the, Ple where's Pleiades? Can I? By, there, there it is, there it is. And you know, if you read the Bible, the Judeo-Christian Bible, where does God live? Yeah, up in the heavens, in this region of the sky. Have people heard that? It's, in, it's somewhere in there. Yeah, I'm just saying that as a fun fact. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Orion is sometimes described as what? The headless hunter. Well, these pillars, they're anthropomorphic, but they don't have a face. They just have a sort of... T shape for the head. I think that fits the headless hunter. But what does Orion have? It has a beautiful belt. And what do we see? Orion's belt, and on these pillars, this one pillar in particular, we see a beautiful belt. No head. Do you see that? But a beautiful belt. He travels with his companion dog. Well, look at the pillar. What's he got under his arm? And, and then the H, which I'll come back to, may be a plasma configuration, but I think that this could well be Orion. And it's looking out to Orion, that part of the sky. Okay, I'm going to jump to another part of the world very quickly. Uh, Gunan Padang in Indonesia, that is myself. This is another example, I believe, that goes back to this very early remote period. Just think about 10,000 BC. This doesn't maybe look real impressive if you don't know what you're looking at, but this was an area on Java. We're talking right here, and this is from a book I wrote a number of years ago. But at the end of the last ice age, sea levels were much what? Lower by, I have it there, 100 to 120 meters in this area. There was a huge subcontinent that was exposed. And this was actually on the southern border of that subcontinent. And what we have here is, you know, Java is very lush. But what we have here is basically a pyramidal type structure made from the local rock, local columnar basalt. This has been studied by Danny Hillman Natawajaja, a geophysicist, PhD geophysicist, uh, very well credentialed. Uh, Katie and I got to meet him and have gotten to know him. We visited the site and I'm convinced 
based on his radiocarbon dating, that this also goes back to this early period. So the point is that we have not just one, not just two, but more sites that go back to this earlier period. I think actually these three are pivotal for making the case. So the Sphinx, Gobekli Tepe, Gunan Padang, and that these could, in fact, be physical remains. In fact, I would assert they are physical remains going back prior to the end of the last ice age to this early period. What the Egyptians called Zeptepe, you can call it whatever you want. If you want to call it Atlantis, that's fine with me. I actually think of Atlantis not as a geographic location, but the concept of an earlier cycle of civilization going back to the end of the last ice age. But something wiped out Zeptepe, wiped out this cycle. What brought it all to an end? And that's what I want to address really quickly right now. What could wipe out advanced civilization? So a little timeline here. We have advanced civilization. We have the end of the last ice age. Then we have this period that's really a dark period where you have not much evidence of anything really sophisticated. People were building mud brick houses, that type of thing. And then we have a reemergence of civilization about 4,000, 3,000 BC. So what's going on here? Something that I think we have at Quebec Le Tepe is evidence of catastrophe followed by intentional burial. But this was undergoing a catastrophe. Look at this pillar here. Do you see how it was knocked down and then rebuilt or re-erected very hastily? This is not modern archaeologists putting in these walls and putting that pillar together again. This is something that was happening at the very end of the last ice age, uh, about 9700 BC, where they were, these had, Pillars have been falling over. I think there's probably earthquakes, that type of thing. They were re-erecting them. They were repositioning. They were putting these crude walls in up against the reliefs. I don't believe for a second they were carving this just to cover it over with a crude wall initially. Everyone follow what I'm saying? Yeah. And look at this one. You see how that one? That is not me. Sometimes people ask. Uh, that uh, how they re-erected this one on a pile of pieces of pillar. And then ultimately they, I don't want to say they gave up, but in a sense they did, or something was going on, they abandoned the site. But before they abandoned the site, they spent, as Klaus Schmidt said, who was the lead archaeologist, they spent as much time burying it and much energy to cover it over purposefully and seal it up as they had to carve it initially, which is pretty amazing, which means it was pretty important, I believe, to them that they took the effort to do that. And it must have been real calamitous times, you know, huge catastrophes going on that they felt they had to do this. So this brings us to the end of the last ice age when they cover it over. Gebekli Tepe, in some ways, just um, ties right in with the Ice Age. And since it's a sort of, a, I hate to use the term snapshot, because it's not really a snapshot, but it captures what's happening at the end of the last Ice Age on the ground for humanity. But the Ice Age, just a little geology here, the end of the last Ice Age, the last 1,200 years of the Ice Age was known as the Younger Dryas. The Ice Age actually was getting warmer. We were coming out of the Ice Age up till 10,900 BC. Then there's a cold snap for about 1,200 years, and then a sudden warming in 9,700 BC, Gebekli Tepe time. So to show you a little chart here, and this is a quasi-log scale, so this is not a linear scale, but here we are very cold in the Ice Age. It gets warm, but then there's this cold snap, and then it gets dramatically warm again. So this is the Younger Dry, this is 1,200-year cold period. And it's an important point to note because people get mixed up as to what the real end of the last Ice Age, and it's actually 
somewhat important. When I was a graduate student, we talked about the Ice Age ending very suddenly, but we were thinking in maybe centuries, a couple of centuries, that would be sudden geologically. If you start talking about, oh, the Ice Age ended in decades, I mean, I would have been thrown out of Yale <laughs> at the time. Seriously, they wouldn't have passed my exam. I wouldn't have passed my exams. I probably would have been called a, oh, you must be a biblical creationist, you know, things happening so suddenly. They're, I, well, they're going to say I don't have enough time to tell too many stories. There was actually someone at Yale in the graduate school at the time in geology who it turns out the faculty figured out was a fundamentalist creationist who was trying to get a Yale degree to then like sort of say, oh, I got a Yale degree, but I'm still whatever. They, they weeded him out. Um, but that's a side note. Don't need to read all this. This is just a paper that came out uh, 10 years ago saying that the Ice Age may have actually ended within one to three years. That was dramatic. That was amazing. But look at this. This is a paper that now came out some year, well, it's 2014, not that long ago, but several years after the other one. This is based on what they call microstratigraphy of ice cores. This bar, you see that bar there? That is the end of the last ice age. Now, to interpret for you, this is older, this is younger. These bars here, these gray bars, mark from here to here is one year, here to here is one year, here to here is one year, here to here is one year. Do you see that bar? That's not even a year. We're talking within weeks, the Ice Age ended, it can be documented. I, would, I believe it's probably literally overnight. So something really sudden happened that we couldn't even fathom, you know, a few decades ago, that it happened that quickly. So what could happen so quickly? It was not a comet. Some people talk about a comet. Two things about a comet, and I'm not going to get into that now, here to a great extent, but the people who have proposed a comet, they're talking about the beginning of the Younger Dryas for it to cause a cooling effect, sort of a nuclear winter effect, not the end of the last ice age, um, but all that evidence has been in my opinion, falsified anyway. But what could cause a very sudden warming in 9700 BC? Based on ice cores, we are talking almost precisely 9700 BC. Uh, the best data is within a few years of that. You know, maybe five years of 9700 BC. Uh, so we've got really precise data on this. Also, at that time, you may have heard of this, the large mammals are going extinct. And we now know that the large mammals went extinct, not at the beginning of the Younger Dryas in 10,900 BC, but at the end. This is um, uncalibrated, but it says 10,000. This is 9,700 BC, that line. And that's when everything finally goes extinct, the large mammals, not small mammals, large mammals. So what was causing this? What could cause, uh, if it's not a comet, what could cause these changes? And it is not a comet, uh, despite some people uh, suggesting that in the popular literature, I'm convinced it was the sun. It was changes in solar activity, but not mild, gradual changes, catastrophic changes, major solar eruptions, major solar outbursts. The, Evidence that's been used for an impactor, a comet or a meteorite, that type of thing, has either been misinterpreted, falsified, couldn't be uh, reproduced by other groups independently, or in some cases the data has stood up, but it's better explained by a solar outburst. And I'm going to show that to you in a second. If you want to read more about this, because I'm not going to go into great detail, go to my website. Um, and you'll see some links. You'll actually see a picture that looks sort of like this. And I also actually talk about an appendix to Origins of the Sphinx a little bit. But what we need to look at is the sun. And the sun becomes very critical, very important here. The uh, sun is quiet sometimes. It's not always quiet. It gives off solar winds. It gives off streams. It gives off 
particles, electrically charged particles. We call that plasma, general term for it. Uh, this is not to scale. There's the sun, there's the earth. The earth has a magnetosphere around it, a protective layer. When you have major discharges, major eruptions from the sun, it can compress that magnetosphere. The energetic particles compress it. Normally they come into the poles. What do you see at the poles? Have people ever seen the northern lights? The aurora borealis, the same thing in the south. But when you have a major um, outburst from the sun, it can compress, it can drive down, and you see things like that and worse all over the earth. So we have things like the aurora borealis. You know, that's, that's fine. That's just little solar streams and mild solar storms. Paul La Violetta, some of you may have heard of him, a very good physicist. He actually found evidence of a massive, what he calls a solar proton event, frying the Earth at 10,900 BC, the beginning of the Younger Dryas. But how would that cause it to get cold? And the answer seems to have come out earlier this year that basically there were major glacial floods. This put lots of fresh water into the Atlantic, into the oceans, change circulation patterns, and ironically, a solar burst at that time caused things to get cold again. So there you have a driving factor. So that could be exactly what happened for this cold period, but then how about this really warm period? And what seems to have happened is there was another major outburst 1,200 years later that now the Earth was in a different shape condition, and that was probably, I think, much more powerful at the time in 9700 BC, and basically knocked us out of that last ice age virtually instantaneously. You know, that basically coronal mass ejections, et cetera, hitting us. All the data indicates that that was what was happening. We actually have Greenland ice core data indicating that sediment core data, uh, moon data, lunar data, that all this was happening in the sun based on isotope data in particular it was extremely active at this time. This is actually not a new theory, but it's only been developed newly by myself and others, but it was suggested back in the 1960s by a fellow named Thomas Gold, who was a Cornell astronomer and uh, astrophysicist, and he's now deceased, unfortunately. But he wrote, in the case of a big solar outburst, the Earth's magnetic field could clearly not hold up the incoming gas, that's the plasma, the charged particles, and it would indeed drive down to the atmospheric level, it would take the form of a series of sparks burning for extended periods of time and carrying currents of hundreds of amperes, and it would cause massive destruction on the surface of the Earth. And he suggested you should look for vitrification. What is vitrification? That's melting of the surface of rocks. What else would be hit by a massive solar outburst? Our satellite, the moon. And he actually found evidence from the Apollo. He was working with the Apollo team in 1969, and he found evidence to quote his entire abstract of this very important paper, some glazing is apparently due to radiation heating. It suggests a giant, what, solar outburst. And he calls it geologically recent times. That would be the end of the last ice age. We find other evidence of solar outbursts that, and probably these things reoccur periodically on Earth. Uh, this is the so-called Libyan Desert Glass, which is in Egypt. It covers approximately 2,500 square kilometers. Standard geological explanation of my colleagues is that it was a meteorite impact. But no pieces of meteorite have ever been found. No crater has ever been found. It's just never made sense. But if you have a major solar outburst with this huge plasma discharges, it's like lightning, orders and orders of magnitude higher than atmospheric lightning covering a huge area, it would cause this type of phenomenon. We have another one, Libyan Desert Glass, covers 400 square kilometers. This is in the Western Desert in Egypt. Do you see how it's, do you see how it's glass? 
It's not glass like window pane glass, but you see how it's melted and then fast frozen again? And work on this, fulgurites. Fulgurites are when you can actually observe a lightning strike, say on a beach, and you can go right there, it's still hot, you can collect the specimens and see what's happened to it. And when people have, in this case, uh, Michael Joseph, have analyzed it, they find that impact glass characteristics, more or less things that people, he says putative impact glass characteristics, things that people have claimed were from comets or meteorites, you find all the same features from major lightning strikes. But of course you don't find pieces of meteorite or crater. So when you start finding these desert glasses like the Dockley, he suggests you have to look at lightning. But you're not going to have a lightning strike that literally covers 400 square kilometers or 2,500 square kilometers just from atmospheric thunderstorms. It's a solar outburst. And there's more evidence. This came out uh, just last year where they were talking about something shock lamella and and various features like that, which everyone always claimed were from comets or meteorites, they're now finding that if you have, even in the modern day, a strong enough atmospheric lightning strike, you get those features. So that's why I was saying before, all these features come together. Uh, you have vitrification on Earth. This is a slightly younger me in uh, Scotland at the mode of Mark. There are these dark age, supposed dark age forts, but they have vitrification on them. Uh, the standard explanation is, oh, people were trying to knock the forts down and they would build big fires against the stone forts and somehow melt the rock. Sort of crazy. But, but it turns out that these so-called dark age forts, like the mode of Mark, by standard um, archaeologists have now been dated back thousands and thousands of years earlier, back to the end of the last ice age. And they were just being reused in five or 600 AD, um, you know, by the King Arthur crowd, that type of thing, who in some of the legends lived in, quote, glass castles. These are the glass castles. It's not beautiful cathedral glass. They realized that there was vitrification. They may not be able to explain it, but there it is. Um, the Sphinx has a history of being hit by a lightning strike. Um, this, we have the inventory stella that was found uh, in the uh, Temple of Isis. This, yes, is a late period stella, but purports to be uh, earlier a transcription or um, uh, a copy of a much earlier text, and on it, it talks about the Sphinx being damaged by a thunderbolt. And Salim Hassan, talk, who was a great Egyptologist of the mid 20th century, he said that, well, there's not a grain of truth to this story. Uh, I'm sorry, he said there is a grain of truth to this story, for the tail of the Nemi's headdress is certainly missing there is actually to be seen on the back of the Sphinx, the scar of this breakage, therefore it is perhaps likely that Sphinx was struck by lightning, but there is not a particle of evidence, that's where it's not, to show that this accident happened in the time of Khufu, the Pharaoh Khufu, which is what the inventory Stella says. I agree, it didn't happen in the time of Khufu, it was much earlier. And if we go to the plateau, um, I'm convinced at this point that this could well be vitrification on the plateau from a major, not an atmospheric lightning strike, but a plasma strike. And there we have it. And when they went to look at the, quote, thunderbolt in dynastic times, they actually knew what they were looking at, a fossilized thunderbolt, if you would, or vitrification from a plasma strike. Here I am. That's the mortuary temple of the second pyramid in the background. And can you see it there? That's uh, from vitrification, from a plasma strike. There I am with it, and there, you see how it looks the same? The bubbly look? So we have all this evidence, in addition to moon data I showed you, and on the plateau, et cetera, we have archeological evidence. And I need to show this very, very quickly. This is Dr. Anthony Perrot. 
um, who is a plasma uh, physicist with Los Alamos National Laboratory. He studies these things. I met him first almost 20 years ago now. And he was studying plasma in a cosmic sense, you know, high discharges from the sun, et cetera. He was going out into New Mexico looking at petroglyphs just for fun, carvings on stones. He found that a lot of these petroglyphs looked at the very distinctive shapes of what he was studying in the laboratory from high voltage, high energy plasma discharges, what he was modeling, what happened from the sun, etc. And he was finding them, lo and behold, on petroglyphs. So you have these pretty aurora borealis, but when plasma discharges get stronger and stronger, they start to take on distinctive shapes. Do you see especially how that takes on a distinctive shape? This is actually a sprite in the upper atmosphere, but just to give you a sense of how they take on these very distinctive shapes. Fortunately, we have not seen really distinctive shapes in recent history, because if we had, it would have done what to us? wipe out all our modern electrical technology, which could be coming. No, I'm not joking about that. But you get what they sometimes call squatter man, um, and the electric universe calls it squatter man, but sort of stick figure men with these, looks like dots on the sides. That's what's known as synchrotron radiation. So very diagnostic feature. And he pointed out that you see this. You see, for instance, these stick figure men with the so-called dots on their sides from synchrotron radiation. Uh, you get bird-headed men, that's a very important concept. You get donut cascading cylindrical shapes. Where's my marker? Um, oh, I think the battery's going. Uh, I'm working it too hard. Yeah, but anyway, you see what I'm talking about, the cylindrical shapes, et cetera, et cetera. So these distinctive shapes, keep those in mind. He and his group have found these in over 130 countries around the world. They were carving these. And you see the dots, the synchrotron radiation? Real humans don't have that. This is, n well, most don't. <laughs> um, and then you get these types of things where it's sort of humanoid cascading figures uh, around the world. Look at this one here with the bird-headed man. And keep bird-headed man in mind, because that becomes very, very distinctive. Uh, Katie and I were with John Anthony West for a conference before he passed away up in Norway. I said, if we're going to go to Norway, we got to see some of the ancient petroglyphs from the end of the last ice age, because they're well dated there when the, when the uh, glaciers came. And there we see them again. We see the cascading rings. We see these weird figures, etc., which are, oh, thank you. Um, we see these again, and they're just what you expect to see in the sky during a major solar outburst. In fact, in 1859, there was a coronal mass ejection known as the Carrington event, when before, unfortunately, good photography for night photography, but people describe seeing these types of things in the sky around the world. That was the Carrington event. It hit. It caused a magnetosphere to collapse. It caused the telegraph lines to go crazy. If that hit today, all our modern electronics and communications would be down. That was 1859. It only affected a few rich people who used telegraph lines. To be crude. Uh, you go to Easter Island. That's, um, I could talk all day about Easter Island, but I don't, they won't let me. Uh, another conference, maybe. It's a, be it's a wonderful place. Katie and I were married there. Yeah. Uh, but it's very remote. And, but its remoteness may be why certain things and certain traditions were preserved there. And they have, look, bird-headed men. Do you see the bird-headed men? I was just mentioning bird-headed men. That's a clue right there. Uh, this is from the 1920s, where they chalked them in so you could see them better. And they've got a whole tradition about that. But they also have something that has eluded people until now, and that is the Rongo Rongo script. These 
Looks sort of like hieroglyphics carved. They carved them into wooden tablets, which wood is, wood is very valuable in East Ram because there's no trees or no major trees, etc. These are not going back to the end of the last ice age. They are copies of copies of copies. But what they seem to be copies of, and they're a great mystery to linguistics until um, Katie, my wife pointed out to me that they look, these inscriptions look very similar to guess what? The petroglyphs, which are the plasma that you would see in the sky. In fact, I am convinced, we are convinced now that the Rongo Rongo, you have the bird headed men, you have the stick figures, um, the bird headed men, you have the sort of the stick figure man, and look at the cascading rings on the Rongo Rongo. Some of those are even closer to the actual physics than most of the petroglyphs. They were recording the same thing, but actually in sequence, it's like a scientific text or recording of what was happening. Um, I could make other connections here. Everyone's heard of NASCA? NASCA lines, they seem to be recording the same thing in a way. Uh, we have it elsewhere in Turkey. Remember I showed this part of this pillar to you? The bird men and whatnot. So there's lots of connections I think that are here. In fact, one possibility is, what are these things here? This could actually be coronal arcing, uh, possibly. But you know, I'm working on that to see, see where we go with that. But Easter Island, for instance, we have legends. Um, it's sometimes called Ice Gazing at the Sky. Um, Mazire, Francis Mazire, long before I was even thinking about this in 1963, he recorded one legend from East Round in the days of Roko Roko Hitao. He was a legendary king. Um, the sky fell, fell from above onto the earth. The people cried out, the sky has fallen in the days of King Roko Roko Hitao. He took cold, he waited a given time. The sky returned, it went away and it stayed up there. I think this could be, in their terms, describing what happens during a major solar outburst. Um, and they're looking up at the sky for a good reason. So. I'm just giving a little bit of the evidence that there was something major that happened with the sun at the end of the last ice age. Uh, Dr. Peratt and his colleagues have published on this. They talked about the evidence from their point of view for this as well. They've never put a date on it, but I believe the date is what? End of the last ice age, 9700 BC. Everything is pointing to that. Um, all the evidence. So what we have is that civilization was essentially wiped out, knocked down to its knees to use that metaphor. Um, whatever metaphor you like, really thrown back to a dark age. Something that Katie and I now call SIDA, S-I-D-A, which stands for Solar Induced Dark Age. Sort of ironic, isn't it, that the sun which brings light it's going to throw us back into a dark age when it erupts. And a dark age, a solar-induced dark age, lasted for about 6,000 years. I think this is what the cataclysm that legends talk about, Plato talks about, etc. that was remembered. And this would wipe out the glaciers, it would wipe out the, um, you know, melt the glaciers instantaneously, it would melt, evaporate water where it hit water, it would cause vitrification, it would put incredible amounts of moisture into the atmosphere. The atmosphere can only hold so much moisture, so it comes down as what? Rain, torrential rains. How many legends are there of torrential rains, biblical floods, et cetera, et cetera? What caused the initial erosion on the Sphinx? These torrential rains, I believe. That caused the initial, yes, it was eroded more later. Um, if you had that to this day, oh, and I want to say there were major earthquakes at the time. And we have that document in the geologic, geologic record. We also now know that solar activity, even in the modern day, is correlated with earthquake activity um, because of 
currents in the crust, et cetera, that respond to the changes in the solar and geomagnetic field. End of the last ice age was a horrendous time. Plus there were high radiation levels on the surface of the earth. Um, and how would you escape? You would escape by going underground. If you're in the know and you know that these are coming back, you're going to prepare underground bunkers, if you would, underground places to live, um, to deposit things. Remember the mammals, the large mammals, they went extinct at this time, 9700 BC. Why the big mammals? Because they could not escape underground. There were high radiation levels. Paula Violetta calculated that five, maybe three to five or days or a week, large mammals could die from the high levels of radiation. How can you escape it? You go underground. That will protect you. Small mammals, small animals, could they go underground very easily? Because they can go into little rocks and crevices and things like that. Humans, are humans large mammals? Yes. So in some cases, people just died. I hate to say it that way, but in other places where there were natural caves or geology that allowed them to go in, they went underground. And I want to point out that sometimes people think the large mammals died off at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. No, the large mammals died off 1,200 years later. The beginning of the Younger Dryas, remember, was the time it actually got colder again. They sort of liked it cold when you're big and furry, that type of thing. Something else that archaeologists have found, and this is the work of Heinrich Kusch and his wife Ingrid, Austrian archaeologist and speleologist into caves. He has found, for instance, that there's massive stone tunnels, these little narrow tunnels. But when do they date to? 12,000 years ago, exactly the time period I'm talking about. Why were they carving these? Why were they going into them temporarily? Because of what I described, what was happening. You start looking at this, and I'm not going to claim all of these go back to the end of the last ice age. I just want to be clear on that. But if this happened to you traumatically, would you think about making preparations if it's going to happen again? Yes, of course. So you've got this going, and uh, you have things like this. In England, there I am, very small, but would this protect you? Or in Easter Island, it would protect you during this type of thing. And these are the so-called stone houses. You have um, caves in many regions. These are in Easter Island that were inhabited, lava tubes, but they've been enhanced for underground protection. Uh, there I am crawling out of one. And, you know, if you have these nice narrow entrances, that would then protect you from radiation, et cetera. And we have traditions even uh, in America compared to East Island on the lower right. Malta, Katie and I went to Malta, and they were so proud to show us where the earliest inhabitants lived. Where? In caves. They didn't have any explanation as to why, but I think we now know why. And India, supposedly these are carved into the cliffs, carved into the rock by the monks. I don't think they were carving these. I think they were reusing things. Yeah, they probably added their own decoration and made them like nice, but it's from an earlier tradition. And if you go to Gunan Padang, there I am there again, Danny Hillman's work. Look, you have a chamber in it in a tunnel going down into that chamber, which was blocked off, it turns out, at the end of the last ice age. Um, so it's all fitting together. The most important is Cappadocia in Turkey, where there's this tradition of going underground in these cities. They have literal cities that could hold tens of thousands of people and cattle and whatnot. Uh, the traditional explanation is that from the archaeologists, oh, they were hiding from their enemies. Well, if you're hiding from your enemies, your enemies are just going to block your air passages and exits and entrances, and you'll die. Plus, they would know exactly where they are because there'd be huge spoil heaps 
that of all the material you dug out, those spoil heaps don't exist. Why? Because I think these actually go back much earlier. It's been um, eroded away. Yes, they were reusing them in Greek and Roman times and Byzantine times, but I think they go back much earlier. Plus, this seems to be an area where they sustained a population that then came back out, if you would, re-emerged. And we have independent evidence of that. There's Gobekli Tepe, we're talking in this portion in Turkey. Linguistic studies, for instance, this is um, published in Science, Mapping the Origins and Expansion of the Indo-European Language Family. And lo and behold, when you start looking, tracing the family trees, if you would, the phylogenies, the evolutions of the language families back, you find that the Indo-European languages go back, if you look at the scale, go back in time to the end of the last ice age, and guess, Cappadocia, this portion of Turkey, where I believe a population survived the catastrophes of the end of the last ice age, then spread out again, and you can document this with the language groups. So it all starts to tie together. In fact, I think this really unifies what's happening in that period. Uh, and we have a cycle of civilization. We have a dark age, Siddha, solar and dark, used in dark age, then the reemergence of civilization. I got to address two last things in my last 12 minutes. And that is one, could it happen again? The short answer is yes. Absolutely. Thomas Gold thought it might be every 10,000 years. That means we're a couple of thousand years overdue. Uh, it's been noted, in, and this is Nature, one of the best scientific publications on Earth, that the sun has had very unusual activity compared to the 11, past 11,000 years in just the last couple of decades. Should that give you pause? Yes. And if you look at this isotope work, the sun was really erratic, had all this high activity at the end of the last ice age. This is um, 10,000 BC up to the present, 10,000 to 4,000, 4,000 to 2,000. Do you see how it was very erratic? Then it sort of calmed down and we had a period of very calm, even low activity for the sun. But guess what? It's now what? becoming very active, very erratic again. And I have 12 minutes, not 10. <laughs> According to my clock. <laughs> um, but true civilization existed prior to the end of the last ice age. And I think these monuments need to be a warning to us. Uh, but I want to say one last thing in my last 11 minutes now. Uh, <laughs> And that is that there's another message from the ancients when it comes to the sun. And this, so I don't want to end on just a negative note that the sun's going, kill us all. <laughs> um, but there's actually a spiritual aspect. I'm convinced of this. There's a spiritual aspect to the sun and its energies. And this ties in with something that John Anthony West was very, very much like to emphasize. And that was the concept of sacred science, our very ancient science and very ancient knowledge. We have the bird man and the bird woman. This is in the Cairo Museum in Egypt, the Egyptian Museum with the Ankh, et cetera. These are solar symbols, plasma symbols, but I think it conveys a much more profound message. Horus, um, the typical bird man. And you can think of this as being a bigger picture, um, something that we could talk about scientific messages passed through myth, passed through legend, passed through art, the only way that we could expect it to come down to us from that very remote period. And so much of um, religion, I think, actually incorporates this. Katie and I went to e um, India, and I uh, got to see things there. This is the Indian god Garunda. Of course, this is a modern 
um, rendition, but look, with a hooked bird nose, the wings, and this was the mount. This carried Vishnu, who was essentially the sun, so carrying the sun through. And in India, our, we were told that in, in India, the sun is considered the ma physical manifestation of God. This was in one of the uh, temples we went to, where if you follow the right and true path, it leads to the formless one God, the sun. So there was something here. And I think it was more than just sort of a sun worship to dismiss it, as some of my academics would say. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, they believed that when we die, we can be reborn as stars in the sky. Or in other terms, we can become the sun. The sun is our star. You can interpret this as becoming a star and up to the sun. This brings up the concept, and I know this is really radical now in some circles, but it, are stars conscious? Is consciousness something that might tie in with the stars and with the sun? What is consciousness at the most fundamental level? I'm going to come back to that in a second. Here, this is from Tutankhamun, uh, one of the shrines. Do you see them? And they're connected to the stars, going up to the stars. And if you look at this, this is um, in one of the temples. And do you see how you're looking at the sky on the ceiling? And you have the stars. And what do you have? These are cartouches. These are the pharaohs becoming stars, going up. I first met Katie um, uh, at a conference. This is my Katie and young me, young both of us, I guess. <laughs> And she talked about, we talked about how the Egyptians believed these things, that you become stars in the sky. And she actually suggested to me that maybe this is a result of our hydrogen in this cycle. Um, I talk about this actually in Forgotten Civilization, um, giving her, of course, full credit. And she suggested, based on what she'd seen on a television program, et cetera, that hydrogen, we are very much hydrogen. If you look at our constituent parts, we have a lot of hydrogen in us. When we die, that hydrogen escapes. It goes somewhere. It's light. It goes up. Uh, people think of um, hydrogen as collecting, as it can collapse down into stars. It can collapse into the sun, et cetera. Oh, this is a, a star man, if you would. He's from one of Ramesses IV in the Valley of the Kings. See him, how he's sitting among the stars? Um, but I start looking into hydrogen. Okay, it's the simplest element, but it's actually got various parts to it, various um, quantum, um, I'm not going to get into that heavily now, but different quantum aspects. It can encode information. It can encode messages, if you would. Uh, and so this becomes very interesting because information is the basis of memories, of personalities, of consciousness. Uh, are you familiar with Emoto's work? Well, he's talking about water. I think it's really applying to the hydrogen in the water. Ultimately, a lot of people dismiss this about how you know water responds to our consciousness, our thoughts, our emotions. But I don't know if you followed this. Other people have reconfirmed that his work was good. Uh, then you have people like Nobel Prize winners. And uh, 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 please forgive my pronunciation, but Luc Montagnier, is that sort of like that? Anyway, Nobel Prize winner, and he's publishing. And I have looked at his original papers, and I am convinced that He's on to something about how water, and I think it's really the hydrogen, carries information. It can imprint um, from DNA and molecules. You actually have a long tradition of this in, um, uh, it just escaped me. Uh, what louder? Homeopathy. Homeopathy and very dilute solutions to the point where you have no chemicals other than water. But it... Yeah, water remembers. Then I want to bring out something else. I'm doing a lot here quickly. Uh, but Cleve Baxter, do people know about Cleve Baxter's work? And the consciousness, I'll use the term consciousness of plants. Most people don't think that that cabbage gets upset when you're cutting its leaves off. But no, I, how, how can we think that we're conscious? Most people will say, well, their dog is probably conscious, but the plant's not conscious. 
I'm not talking the same level of consciousness as maybe us, but maybe we are, um, and they just can't express it as well. So this all ties back. And when you look at this, physically we die, our hydrogen, its constituent subatomic particles are released, um, hydrogen carries information, it goes up, it's entangled at a quantum level in you. You can entangle with you know, loved ones, people you're emotionally um, close to, and you have diverse collections of hydrogen, and something that's very important is it carries different sets of information. Um, keep that in mind. Mind And the personality, the consciousness of a person, I don't know if you realize this, but you don't have, you have different components of consciousness, different what I call psychic components or soul components. And one thing that many traditions suggest, including ancient Egyptians, is you have to keep those all integrated or crystallized or together. Otherwise, they'll literally go flying off into a part, especially after this physical life deceases, um, ceases to be. So matter and consciousness, they're interlinked, which is more fundamental. Here I have to show you my favorite modern physicist, Max Planck, and he talked about this. I regard, this is a quote from him, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything we regard as existing postulates consciousness. And I would agree with that. Coming back to Katie and the theories and the ancient Egyptian beliefs, they acknowledged that we have all these different, I'll call it psychic components to us, these different components of consciousness that you have to integrate if you're going to be a whole and proper being, especially if you want to become a star in the sky or join the sun in the sky. And then look at this. This is a beautiful statue of um, Khafra or Chephron in the Egyptian museum. He's reputed to have been the builder of the second pyramid, also the Great Sphinx has been attributed to him, but you start looking at him closely. What do we have? We have the bird, the bird man, the bird man theme, um, the sun, the bird man, eternal life, but we have plasma and solar themes on him. Uh, so he's a bird man, if you would, he's on a lion chair, well, the lion is associated with the sun. I don't know if you know that. Traditionally, lion and sun go together. Um, we have plasma, torus rings. Remember the cascading rings that we talked about? Here you see it. On There's the bird man, there's the cascading rings, the lion. This is all solar, I believe, solar illusions. Um, solar is speaking to the sun, it's speaking to... Um, uh, Going back to the sun, uh, this is Horus, of course. Horakate, he's a living sun. Here's Horus, you're familiar with Horus, but Horus is a bird man also. So to me, it's all tying together. Then what's this thing on the side? This is a very strange thing. On the side there, we see the cascading rings and lion again. But if you're familiar with a famous book, Hamlet's Mill, um, they suggest that this is not what a lot of Egyptologists interpret as being, Upper and Lower Egypt being united, the two countries being united. They suggest this is an astronomical journey, the celestial cycle, the processional cycle, or I would say maybe uniting heaven and earth. Um, and of course, symbolism can hold many different meanings at many different levels, uh, but this may be referring to a processional cycle as well, or a uniting of the cosmos with the terrestrial. Uh, so in many ways, this entire statue refers to the sun, to the heavens, to the cycle of the ages, and our ultimate union with the celestial, with the divine. Just two, two other examples and just a couple of other notes. Um, another example, here's Anubis, Lord of the Dead, standing over the deceased, and he's being carried on a lion bed. Again, the sun, that represents the sun, uh, we believe, Katie and I believe. So going back to the sun, going back to the stars. Or look at this in the Cairo Museum in Egypt. They call this a cow palette, that this is a cow or Hathor, but 
look at another interpretation. It's a star man. Do you see the stars on the side, like the synchrotron radiation, the stars, the star head? I think it's saying something possibly very, very different. I want to give just the two notes, because I know they're going to kick me off in two minutes. So I'm already pressing my time. Um, but a kindred spirit, this is John Anthony West, who we started this journey with. I started this aspect of my life with this journey with. He was a remarkable character. I had a remarkable journey with him. He became a very good um, uh, colleague and personal friend. And I do want to say that if you'd like to go to my website, I have a tribute to him on the news and events page. He's now on his way to the sun. But coming back to the Sphinx, and this is where I'm wrapping up, um, the G, um, J.W., John Anthony West, had profound insights, and they were well beyond the Sphinx. Um, West loved Egypt, there can be no doubt, but his interest in Egypt was not what many people who knew him superficially assumed. Um, he was not simply another Egyptophile. He didn't, you know, decorate his house all with Egyptian themes, although he had lots of Egyptian stuff. There's one idea that John Anthony West always held above all others. He believed and presupposed, and I'm going to quote him now, a universe in which consciousness, meaning, and order are written into the fabric of its creation. He thought that was the universe we inhabit, not a mechanistic, mean, meaningless universe caused by chance and random events. He thought there was meaning and order as all traditional religions and societies have always insisted, and in this universe, on this particular planet, humanity has been placed for a reason, with unique privileges and unique responsibilities. If we believe, this is still the West quote, if we believe that the universe is a conscious creation and the and that humanity is on earth for a purpose, then whatever serves that purpose is practical. Whatever does not serve that purpose is at best a waste of time, at worst, evil. Knowledge of that purpose is science, sacred science. There cannot be the slightest doubt that the science of order, purpose, meaning, and the transformation of the carnal or material to the spiritual was what once prevailed on earth. For a civilization to be worthy of the name, it must be based upon a sacred science. Through the efforts of a number of brilliant scholars over the past couple of centuries, key elements of the lost sacred science have been rediscovered or reformulated. The sacred science provided those who understood its laws with the guidelines for carrying out the preordained responsibilities, that inner transformation of the carnal, material, and merely rational beings they were by birth into the spiritual beings we all are by birthright. And I think that's beautiful and important. And West would say that we are not a spiritual society, we are not a spiritual civilization, we are not based on a sacred science, but in ancient Egypt, and in particular, he found what he considered to be a civilization that understood these principles. And so his real interest in Egypt, and yes, Egypt had its downfall, um, it had its problems, there was crime in Egypt, but the point is that he was convinced it was really based on a very different set of principles than we, um, uh, most people at least, maybe not people in this room, I hope not people in this room, but people then grab to this day. So if you want, here's the advertisement, which is my last slide, they'll be happy to know. Um, if you would like to experience this sacred science on the ground, come to Egypt with me. I am um, very sad to say um, that I led the last John Anthony West tour to Egypt. He was known for his tours to Egypt. He couldn't do it. He was too sick before he died um, to lead the last tour that had already been organized. People had paid for so I led it for him. I was pleased. Well, I was, un you know, it was bittersweet type of thing. When he found out I was leading it for him, um, he said I was basically the only one that could do it. Um, you know, and really represent him properly. Um, but it was, you know, I didn't want to be leading it under such circumstances. And, you know, it, it, 
it, it's very sad. I don't want to start crying or something. Um, but this is not just me. This is Oracle. Organization for the Research of Ancient Cultures. It's a nonprofit organization that was set up. West was involved with it. John Anthony West was involved with it behind the scenes setting it up. It's really to carry on the legacy. Um, the Oracle is sponsoring this trip next year in June. If you'd like to join it, come to my, go see my website. And if you'd like to learn about more of this, these are the books to look at at the moment. And I'm, I've got other older books, and I'm working on future ones. But thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. That, you, you just rewrote history there. You, it was an amazing history lesson. Thank you. I mean, this was a paradigm shifting moment. Wow, thank you so much. But let me just ask you, I mean, we, we don't have to go to dinner right away, but when these solar outbursts um, hit the Earth, is it just one or was there a no, series of them? Actually, actually, that's a very good question because a lot of people ask about that. What I'm seeing from the isotope data, I use the analogy, I'm a geologist. You have a major earthquake, but a lot of times you have little foreshocks and then you have aftershocks. And not to scare anyone, but the 1859 Carrington event and a few others could be foreshocks. Um, but I'm not, and I'm not trying to be a scare mo fear monger or anything, because I don't have anything to sell you, like right, prepping right. kits. But in answer to, <laughs> no, I, yes, yeah, some caves, I yeah, know. yeah, some caves. Right. No, but seriously, that's one thing people have said, asked me. They say, oh well you know, it was all over. Why would they continue to build underground structures and whatnot? No, I don't think it was all over with the first big one that drove us out of the Ice Age. If you saw the isotope data, some of it I showed you in one of the graphs, the sun was very erratic for quite a considerable time until it calmed down. So they were probably experiencing smaller ones, and so it kept the memory alive. This could happen again. One more question. What does the sky look like? Or what would you imagine it looked like when these things happened? Oh, actually, when it was happening, forest fires were being set. There was a lot of moisture. There was a lot of rain. So it was probably very cloudy. They, they described this actually for the 1859 Carrington event, which was much milder. So there's probably a lot of debris and whatnot in the sky, but coming through it, what you would have these plasma figures. So they would look like sort of these figures almost in fire that you would see in the sky looking like stick men or bird men. When the sky men. is falling, they talk about yeah, what did they see? They would, these plasma yeah, yeah, they would see these things. They would look like they'd be falling down on you. They wow. Well, in some cases, the plasma actually would hit and you'd be dead then. Wow. Um, but Amazing. yeah, yeah. Well, th thank you again. I mean, you're going to be taking questions, signing books out there somewhere. Yeah. Okay, Robert Chalk, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, come up. And